Dawn Jeffries joins us live now. She's in Northern Virginia where that chase came to an end. So Dawn, officers there saw the end of this whole ordeal. What are they telling you now? They did indeed, John, as you mentioned. This is basically where it came to an end. Just on the other side of this wooded area is Interstate 66, and that's where state police tell us that Vester Flanagan wrecked his vehicle. Here's what led up to that. A state trooper, her name is Pam Neff. She was on Interstate 81 at the 66 exit ramp. I'm very familiar with this area. I have family about 20 miles up the road. This exit ramp is about 18 miles from us. Now, Trooper Neff had just entered the latest description of the vehicle police put a be on the lookout for into her tag reader keep in mind they had been getting a number of different vehicles sending out information to different law enforcement throughout the morning she put that last information into that tag reader now the tag reader is a device that scans license plates as they go by sort of like in the grocery store when it scans your items the tag reader scans the license plate and trooper Flanagan says that uh, he was not speeding in fact, he was driving down the interstate, straddling two lanes. No other cars were in the area. Flanagan was flown to the hospital. He died about 1.30 this afternoon. Live in Fauquier County, Dawn Jeffries, WSLS 10. The board of the Northwest Child Development Center fired the executive director, Jacqueline Wiggins, and shut the doors to parents and children. Now, this comes after the community rallied to raise thousands of dollars to avoid a shutdown just earlier this month. A lot going on here in this story. WSLS 10's Don Jeffries uncovered documents showing allegations of questionable financial practices long before Wiggins was hired. It ain't no way seven directors can be wrong. Jacqueline Wiggins, who was fired as executive director last night, rallies parents outside the Northwest Child Development Center in Roanoke. You better fight. You fight. The center's board of directors called a meeting late Wednesday and fired her just four months into the job. I am not surprised that they have fired me. I am surprised, though, that in within six years, I am the seventh executive director who has been fired, and that should have raised a red flag in this community long before I got here to find or inherit this situation. A situation Wiggins calls deplorable and grossly negligent, sparked by the loss of $100,000 in funding by the United Way. The board has not shown financial stability of Northwest uh, Child Development Center, but instead gross negligence. WSLS 10 obtained a number of documents, including this one from the United Way to board chairman Derek Willis back in January. It shows United Way's concern about Northwest's finances and internal controls and explained the agency was withholding funding until the matters were resolved. WSLS 10 also obtained this memo from previous executive director Gregory Cooper reporting to the board he'd lost confidence in two board members, including Willis. The memo goes on to outline instances where Willis wrote checks for thousands of dollars without the required two signatures and to his own company for services. I'll sleep what I can do. We tried to talk to board members at Northwest Thursday. None would talk about the allegations or whether parents were told the center would be shut down today before they showed up to drop off their kids. Are parents being told? Or parents, parents are to? being told. Okay. So parents knew this morning that they weren't going to have child care? Can you explain how some showed up without child care then? Parents say there was no warning. And I was just like so stunned by the situation because I have to be at work. Bus drivers bringing a handicapped child Thursday afternoon had no idea either. Board members handed employees a letter saying the center would close for good at the end of the month, citing its inability to survive without funding. The board definitely needs to have a heart and they need to consider stepping down for these children so that we can reconstruct this board. Funding and support can come in. Support the United Way confirms it would consider reinstating under Wiggins' leadership and if the current board stepped down. It's not unheard of for little girls to dream of being a princess. No, not at all. But a Virginia father's quest to make his daughter's dream come true led him to uh, led him rather thousands of miles around the world. WSLS 10's Don Jeffries shares their movie-like story in tonight's special report. Emily Heaton is like a lot of seven-year-olds. I like to play outside. I like to swing. <laughs> she likes math, reading, playing with her dolls, and dreaming of being a princess. 
Just over a year ago, she asked her father, Jeremiah, if she could be a real princess. As any father would, I told her that she could be. And, uh, you know, I felt bad about making a promise that I couldn't keep because if she'd asked to be a doctor or a lawyer, I most certainly would have affirmed her desire to do that as well. He then set out to fulfill his promise. His search started online, where he looked to see if it was even possible to find unclaimed land where he could create his own country. Researching the matter and was able to find land uh, in northeastern Africa called Bur Tawil that met the criteria that would allow me to create my own nation. Bur Tawil, an 800 square mile unpopulated patch of desert between Egypt and Sudan. Months later, Heaton was on his way to Egypt. Once there, on Emily's seventh birthday, he planted the flag of his kingdom, the kingdom of North Sudan. Heaton's three children came up with the crown and four stars on royal blue. Heaton was now king, he says, Emily, his princess. But it wasn't happily ever after just yet. Emily recalled one of her teachers traveling on mission trips to Africa where she helped children who were starving. She travels to Africa and she um, brings stuff with her to help them and gives them things. Emily wanted more. In her very simple childlike terms, she asked if we could grow a garden big enough to feed everyone. Not understanding the challenges of doing that in the desert, Heaton once again set out to see if it was even possible. Being in the desert, you, you know, it's as dry as it can be. And if we can figure out a way to grow food in the desert using a very limited amount of water, uh, using new technologies, then that technology can be applied elsewhere in the world where it might not be quite as dry. The husband and father of three who left the mining industry in southwest Virginia to develop mine safety equipment is now adding on another project, developing an agricultural research center, a place where scientists from around the globe can come together at a laboratory to develop new ideas in hopes of solving world hunger. Right now we have 1,100 scientists on our list and the list is growing daily. Heaton is using the interest in what some see as a simple princess story to draw attention to the project. The self-proclaimed fundraiser in chief is a week into an Indiegogo crowdfunding campaign to get the seed money to get the project off the ground. Now, we don't intend to fund the entire project through the Indiegogo campaign, but it gives us a really good jump start on what we're trying to do. Donors in return get perks like honorary titles of nobility, an engraved brick used in construction, or a road in their name. Heaton believes Egypt would welcome a center it could also benefit from along its border. They're very savvy. They understand the benefits that I bring to the area, and they see the project for more than just a simple princess story. They understand that I have real goals and ambitions. An ambitious idea sparked from a little girl learning almost anything is possible. Heaton hopes to take the next step in making the center a reality within the next two years by building a power generation facility made up of mainly wind turbines to put in the area. And by the way, he tells me they've reached a deal with Disney wow. to write a story about their real life story. And he didn't wow. buy the land, by the way. This was unclaimed well, territory. Who knew it was unclaimed land? In I know, the right? Still, right? Fascinating. So, so he went and claimed the land, put a flag in the ground, mm -hmm. now it's his. Yeah. And we'll send you down to WSLS 10's Don Jeffrey. She joins us now live. And Don. What are you seeing there? Well, actually, Patrick, this snow is really just starting to pick up here within the last 45 minutes or so. So students really didn't have to trudge through much to get to class this morning. As you mentioned, school was canceled uh, about 10 minutes ago, starting at noon this afternoon. So what you're seeing behind me is students uh, leaving class or heading back to their dorms. Um, again, that happened at 12 o'clock. Uh, classes are canceled. Everything for the evening is canceled. And I'm thinking they're pretty excited, right? <laughs> this rarely happens. <laughs> Uh, again, students are um, heading off, presumably, to their dorms, uh, back to their apartments as they're leaving class. Again, this just really started here within the last 45 minutes. Uh, my photographer, Greg, came down from Roanoke this morning and said it was uh, really heavy there, so it was kind of following him on his way down here. The university will make a decision on tomorrow, presumably later today or into tonight, about what will happen. But again, it's a lot of wait and see and watch to see what this system does. Live in Blacksburg, Don Jeffries, WSLS 10.